So I'm just going to ask you um, to tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Meet the candidate. And and I saying your name, Inman or Iman? Inman. Inman. Okay. I was hearing you before. Okay. I don't hear her. You don't hear me? Um, I'm on here. Yes, it's, you are. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, okay. Very good. I thought you couldn't hear me. Okay. So just want to let the, you know, introduce you again, um, Ms. Inman. Um, you are the Democratic Party nominee for the NC Supreme Court um, Associate Justice um, Seat 3. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, thank you very, very much for having me on your show. I appreciate it. I am running to fill an open seat on the North Carolina Supreme Court this year as one of our most respected justices is retiring. I'm currently a judge on the North Carolina Court of Appeals, and I'm running to make sure that the Supreme Court continues to decide cases fairly and impartially and free of partisan political agendas. Uh, before winning election to the Court of Appeals eight years ago, I served as a Superior Court judge in counties across the state, including in Pitt County. And before becoming a judge, I represented clients in the trial courts for 18 years. And before that, um, I before I went to law school, I worked as a newspaper reporter, and that's really how I became interested in the courts. Okay, so you... you when you're working in the appeals court, that's pretty much you're not intermingling with people. And what is the difference then working, wanting to be now in the Supreme Court um, versus the appeals? Well, um, like the appeals court, and you're absolutely right, the appeals court and the Supreme Court both, we don't hear witnesses, we don't work with jurors. Um, and um, but I can remember my experience as a trial court judge and a lawyer and that every single case involves real people. The difference between the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court is that the volume of cases is much greater at the Court of Appeals. Everyone has a right to an appeal to the Court of Appeals in just about every case. The Supreme Court only takes cases where there's a divided decision at the Court of Appeals or if it's an issue that the Supreme Court in its discretion feels it needs to take. And the other really important difference is that on matters of common law and state constitutional law and statutory interpretation, the North Carolina Supreme Court has the last word on the law. There's no further appeal from its decisions. Okay, so what are your qualifications for this uh, particular judgeship? Well, um, I believe my qualifications include my 12 years of service as a judge, four in the trial court and four at the Court of Appeals, 18 years of representing clients before the trial courts and some appellate work. But it also, these qualifications include what I call soft skills, the ability the ability we are into we're this is meet the candidate um again my name is renee boston hill um kind of like loss um communications but we're going to keep talking um because we do have the pleasure of interviewing Miss Miss Lucy Eman. So you look you left off with the ability. Um, she's a Democratic Party nominee. The ability um, for, to listen and keep an open mind. And what she's briefly telling us, okay. Um, she's running running again. I apologize. I sincerely apologize. I'm traveling the state and and uh, have a bad internet connection. I sincerely apologize. I mentioned the ability to listen. 
is really important for Supreme Court justice and the ability to do what our middle school math teachers taught us to do. And that is show your work. Judges should never think they have the answer to a question before looking at the facts and the law. Okay. Um, well, to me, everything has become politicized. What role does party play? Um, it is most unfortunate to me that political party plays a role in our judicial elections. When I was elected statewide in 2014, that was the last year our judicial election party plays, in my view, is to label candidates and to create an expectation on behalf of members of a party that candidate is affiliated with, that the candidate is always going to rule in a way that puts forward the party's platform. And it creates fear among those who are not affiliated with the party that the judge is affiliated with, that the judge is always going to put forward that party's platform. Partisan agendas have no place in our courts, um, but the legislature has decided that we must run under partisan labels. You can't run without a partisan label unless you get signatures of tens of thousands of people. And um, I am a lifelong Democrat. I'm proud to be a Democrat, but I leave that partisan identity behind when I am deciding cases. Okay. Now that COVID um, is still out there and the pandemic we don't have, what is what are your expectations now that in-person court has resumed? Well, in-person court is, mu is a much greater challenge in our trial court courts every person who's been summoned for jury duty, every person who has business with the court, um, as long as we still have COVID, there's going to be a public health danger that must be considered in bringing people to our courthouses. We have had some improvement in online access to the trial courts, and we have more programs rolling out to allow people to take care of some of their business without going to the county courthouse. At the appellate courts, we are back hearing in-person oral arguments, <coughs> excuse me, but we still have the option for lawyers to argue virtually, just, just like on a, like a Zoom with judges. And one of the silver linings of that technology is that any member of the public can watch either live or on video later every single appellate argument in North Carolina's Court of Appeals and Supreme Court. Okay. What, um, how, how do you know if a court is running well? How do I know if a court is running well? Well, if I'm working in the court, um, meaning if I'm a member of a court, I have a lot more information about the, the function of the court. Um, a lot of that information, I have to say, is confidential, and that is because communications among judges is, is confidential and privileged. Um, but looking from outside of the court, which is where voters are looking, a way to see if a court is functioning well is to pick up any opinion issued by that court and see if you can understand how the court reached its decision. Okay. If you cannot understand how the court reached a decision in a case, the court is not functioning well. Okay. Um, another question that I would have for you is, what is your dual district, juridical philosophy and how will it support your mission in the Supreme Court? My judicial philosophy doesn't have an ism after it. It's not originalism. It's not textualism. It's not an ideology. It is basically that 
judges are required to honestly review the records to determine what the facts are in any individual case, honestly review precedent that is prior decisions by other courts and other legal authorities, including statutes and our state constitution, and determine what the law is, and then apply the law to those facts in a rational manner. And to do so, while to explain to not just the parties, not just the lawyers, not just other courts, but the public, how the law applies to those facts and how a court reaches a conclusion. Okay. Um, we spoke a little bit about the um, technology and how it's now been integrated um, into the courts. Um, Supreme Court, well, the appeals court or the appellate court, they've been using the new technology. Are the courts today um, up to date where when, if you get into the Supreme Court, um, are they still, has technology reached that area? Yes, at the appellate courts, technology has, is, is working fine. We had been planning before the pandemic to make our oral arguments that were in the courtroom live streamed to the public but it hadn't happened yet. And the pandemic forced us to get ready quicker than we thought we'd need to be. We've now had two years to get ready. Um, I presided in the very first virtual oral argument at the Court of Appeals, and we practiced with the lawyers, we talked ahead of time, um, and, and I really found that it, it works very, very well. The only challenge is that the lawyers who appear that way need to be in a place where they have a secure internet connection. You can imagine how stressful it would be for a lawyer if they were presenting an oral argument from the road, like I am speaking to you. Okay. And to see that they lost connection um, that would be very very okay. what about your style um, that would make you a good Supreme Court um, judge um, what about my style yes yeah. um, um, my my style is um, first of all I sound like a broken record but I think, I think I'm a good listener. And it's important to be able to listen um, to lawyers who are presenting cases, but also to the other justices, because often judges don't agree. And if you don't agree with someone, the first step is to understand what their point of view is and why they have it. And understanding that can help you double check to make sure that's really the way I think the analysis goes. And number two, if I do explain cordially, professionally, I will say in a friendly manner what my position is. Collaboration is really, really important, and that's part of my style. Okay. This is Meet the Candidate. My name is Renee Boston Hill, and I have the pleasure today of interviewing and having a conversation with Miss Lucy Inman. She's a Democratic Party nominee for the NC Supreme Court Associate Justice Seat 3. And just been just talking and, and just finding out um, why she wants to serve. Why do you want to serve? <laughs> well, Renee, that is a great question. That's a <laughs> Um, want to serve because I I believe the best role for me in the justice system is in this neutral role. I think I told you that before I ever went to law school, I worked as a newspaper reporter. Okay. And I learned then that all, all, all people
people want the same thing from the judge. Even people treated with respect. I much prefer being in the neutral role and think I have an ability okay well you know i just want to let i want to let our listening audience know uh, that um and, and it is this a Friday, tremendous responsibility to serve on the supreme court and i care about the future of our supreme court Okay, um, I just want to let the, um, the audience know also that Friday, this Friday, October 14th, um, is the last day to register to vote. Your ballot would have to be postmarked on the same day, and if you bring it into the County Board of Elections office, it has to be there by 5 p.m. Early voting starts October the 20th, and it's a one-stop voting, um, and if you're not registered, you can register to vote that day at the one-stop, and then also cast your ballot. Tuesday, um, November the 1st, deadline to request absentee ballots. Saturday, November the 5th, um, early voting um, ends. And Tuesday, November the 8th, is... Um, Tuesday, November the 8th is the general election day. Uh, Ms. Eman, could you tell us um, how our listening audience can help or support your campaign? Yes, I will. And first, Renee, thank you for going through all of those deadlines. It's so important that people register to vote and vote, especially if you live in a district where you might feel like your voice isn't heard in local politics. When you vote in a statewide race, like the Supreme Court races, your vote counts just as much as every other person's vote throughout the state. People can help me most by letting their family and their friends and their neighbors and their coworkers know that they heard a little bit about Lucy Inman and that they trust Lucy Inman and recommend them to others they know. Because people who trust you are far more likely than they are to take the word of strangers. I think, have you interviewed Justice Sam J. Irvin? Yes, I did. state and and um he needs i do uh say to people that they say makes it easy to remember our names is look for lucy search for sam save the supreme court okay <laughs> so that, that, i guess you'll get I know, out of the camera i know it sounds cheesy but people say they they remember it Okay. <laughs> I'm going to have you repeat that then. <laughs> sure. You can, can you repeat what you said? Sure, I can. It's look for Lucy, search for Sam, protect the Supreme Court so the Supreme Court can protect you. Okay, definitely. <laughs> All right. So, um, did you give out your information? Um, where they can reach you. Um, maybe you might need help with canvassing or phone yes. banking. We definitely need help with canvassing and, and phone banking. And the phone banking we also ask people to do is calling the people they already know. Okay. Because um, you get a lot more, you, people will pick up and talk with you. But my website address is lucyinmanforjustice.com. And you can and go on that website or email info at lucyinmanforjustice.com. It's L-U-C-Y-I-N-M-A-N-F-O-R-J-U-S-T-I-C-E dot com. We very much need volunteers for canvassing, for phone banking, for getting out the vote. 
if everyone would please make it a goal to ask five people you know if they're voting. And if they are, ask them if they're voting in the Supreme Court races. Okay. If they're not, please um, tell them that it's important to do because it affects every person's freedoms and responsibilities. Right. And they and um, the Board of Elections, they handed out a ballot about the judges and it's very informative. I've been using it as my <laughs> as my support system to be able to have um, to, just to know more about um, our judges or people who are candidates for judgeship. The other thing, um, what do you think about term limits on for the Supreme Court? Well, um, for the North Carolina Supreme Court? Yes. Mm -hmm. You mean for the North Carolina Supreme Court? Um, you know, the terms of North Carolina Supreme Court justice are, are eight years. And also, right now, by statute, all judges are required to retire at age 72. Okay. I am 61. If I am elected um, this year, I think I would be 68 when I completed my term. Unless the legislature extends the retirement age, I couldn't serve a second eight-year term. I think that having that mandatory retirement age provides a sufficient limit. Um, I think it is a good thing when judges can serve more than one term. Um, that's different than serving for life. Okay. Um, tell us something about, tell us um, something that we don't know about you. Well, let's see. Something that you don't know about me um, is that um, for eight years, I'm from North Carolina. I thought I'd be here my whole life. But for eight years, I lived in Los Angeles. And that okay. was because after I graduated from law school, I fell in love with the newspaper reporter who was going to graduate school there. Hmm. And while I was in Los Angeles, I represented many different clients, but one of them might be known to your listeners. His name was Carol O'Connor, and he was an actor who played the role of Archie Bunker in oh, All okay. in the Family. Mm -hmm. And he also played the role of a sheriff in a television show called In the Heat of the Night. His son, Hugh, was also an actor and appeared as a deputy on In the Heat of the Night. Hugh, unfortunately, was a cocaine addict, okay. and he uh, and he committed suicide one night. And when the media all went to Carol O'Connor's house to ask about his son, you know, most celebrities would say, please respect my family's privacy at this time. But Carol O'Connor said, I want everyone to know that my son was an addict, and I am responsible as anyone else for his life, but I want you to hear the name of Harry Perzigian because that was my son's drug dealer. And he continued to sell drugs to my son after I begged him not to. Well, the drug dealer sued Carol O'Connor for defamation. Carol also called him a partner in murder. Those are strong words. Mm -mm. And we were put in a position where we had to prove to the jury that Carol O'Connor had reason to believe his words were true. We proved that because his son paid for all his cocaine in checks okay. and every check was made out to the name of the man that he'd named. Okay, very good. Um, well, we have a couple of minutes. Why don't you do a closing, um, your closing remarks to the, to the audience? Oh, very well. Thank you again so much, Renee for this opportunity to speak with you and, and with your, your listeners. Um, I just appreciate it so much. It has been the honor of my life to serve as a judge to the state of North Carolina for the past dozen years. I am thrilled to be on the ballot this year and I'm working hard to earn the trust of voters at a time when state courts across the nation are being asked to make some of the most difficult decisions in our lifetimes. I pledge to decide all cases fairly and impartially so that we maintain the public's trust to keep our communities safe, protect personal freedoms, and preserve our democracy. I humbly request 
and hope to earn the votes of this audience. Okay, this has been Meet the Candidate. My name again is Renee Boston Hill, and um, this is Awesome Radio. And again, we encourage you to get yourself educated, and if nothing else, vote. But vote because you know that this candidate is going to be able to serve you and serve our state well. Um, meet the candidate again. And um, we want to thank you very much, Ms. Um, Lucy Inman, for coming on our show today. Thank you very, very much. I greatly appreciate it. Okay. Goodbye. All right. All right, this has been Meet the Candidate. And again, my name is Renee Boston Hill. You'll be able to view this should you have missed any of it on our awesome radio application. But again, thank you and have a great day. Thank you. This is Larry Hall, former secretary of the North Carolina Department of Military and Veterans Affairs. The time is now to increase resources for our community and advocate for 